discussion on uh, some testing with an Android, and um, we will have some credits in a few minutes or so. Thanks for coming. Well, welcome. Um, and I'm Brad Armstrong. You may have met me before, so you before here. Um, I'm Scott here at Book Room 2, and I do some Android development freelance through my company, the Farm and Software. So if you've been in this room for this whole morning so far, you see two really excellent national speakers. <clears throat> so I think what they figured we'd do is like switch that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, this keeps into professional content. One after another is just tired. So they brought me in. Um, and I had all kinds of stuff planned, but I, I have no idea how long this time will take. It's going to be somewhere between 20 minutes and 60 minutes, but either way, it's going to be 50 minutes. So that's what we're going to shoot for. Okay, so why are we here today? Right. 10x Android, your life changed in 45 minutes, right? That's what we're going to do. But you read the fine print of my summary, right? Okay, so this is how these uh, kind of conferences work. They have you uh, submit a talk, you know, like months ago, and then um, and you put your title and you put a summary. And so um, this is what I call it. I wrote that summary. They're like, oh, you can change it when you want to. Like, yeah, I probably will. And then I didn't. So I thought, well, now it's called 10x Android. It's been out there, and that's what it's going to be. So I'm like, what does this 10x thing mean? I know it's kind of a discussion out in the community, and I didn't even pay any attention to it because I, I really don't care. But um, I thought, well, I better go read a little bit about it. And, and the discussion about if the 10x developer exists or not, or Rockstar developers, we could spend this whole session just talking about that, which I definitely do not want to do. But, so I just want to break it down into what I what I read in my five minutes that I studied this. Um, there's these two distribution curves of how we think this our abilities can be measured. Um, IQ is something that follows the normal distribution curve on your left. Um, but it turns out that uh, our abilities actually follow something more like a power law distribution. That means that most of us are below average, instead of most of us being around average. Okay, what does that mean? That means that if I can just get you from the first bar to the second bar, or maybe even the third, we definitely, that's two, three X right there, you're way ahead of everyone else. So that's what we're gonna try to do today. How are we gonna do that? All right. Let's see. There's one thing that all those people in that first bar, this is my this is my guess. There's something that they have in common. And that's that they don't write any tests for their code. Maybe because they don't understand how, um, or they just don't know the value. But I'm pretty sure none of them have tests. And so if I can just get you to write some tests, 2x. We're already at 2. That's easy. And we might even be able to get three if we can throw in some other cool stuff in there. So let's try that. But it's going to take a little work to get to that first part because Android testing is hard. It's a lot harder than it should be. Um, if, if you came from a, like a Java server environment or something where you wrote a lot of unit tests and then you said, oh, it's Java, like, like uh, Jeff was talking about today, it's Java, I can do Android. And then you get to Android, you're like, how do I write tests? You realize it's very quickly, it's kind of crazy, or at least it was. It's getting better. Um, I'm pretty sure that the people that originally wrote the framework had no test coverage. Because if they had written tests for that, it would not have been designed the way it is. Um, and we'll see why that is. So when we're talking about testing today, we'll be talking about how to test, but also how to get your app in a state that is testable. All right. So. Just some terminology before we get started. Um, I'm going to be talking about unit tests and integration tests and functional tests, or maybe you want to call them UI or end-to-end. -end. Um, I see a lot of confusion about what is a unit test versus an integration test. And because I'm the one speaking, I get to define it today. So um, just because a test is run with some AJ unit runner does not make it a unit test. <laughs> okay, that's my definition, at least. Uh, 
So a unit test is when you're testing like a small little piece of code, like your a public API, a sort of like a method, public method, or maybe it's just an algorithm, and it's in this really controlled environment where all the collaborators are around it, and you can kind of have some control over it. You know how they're going to behave. You're really just interested in throwing some input at this thing and seeing and verifying that it behaves correctly in this input. Okay, so it's very focused, very controlled. That's a unit test. You can whip through these things like half a second easily, quick iterations. Integration tests, in my mind, when you like put some more components together and you're looking at how a process flows through them. And maybe you have a runtime, or maybe it's partial runtime, it's sort of marked out. I um, mean, maybe you have a database, you probably don't have a network. So that's an integration test to me. Uh, probably. So in the Android world, at least it used to be that they called Android unit tests, the Android unit tests were really integration tests because you had to run them on a device. There's no way that you have to start a device to run a unit test. So um, when we're talking about Android tests, to me those are integration tests. So I just want to call that out because we're going to talk about actual unit testing today too on Android, which to me has always been something I've been trying to figure out how to do more effectively, and it's getting easier, and they're helping us with that, and so we're going to talk about that. Okay. So, if you've seen me do other talks here, and I think this is the third year that I've been here, it's only going on for years, um, there's one mistake I always make. Uh, so, when, so when I'm giving one of these talks, I like to build, start talking about all the components and laying those things out, and then I sort of start taking those and putting them together and mixing them out, and then what I want to do is at the very end, I want to say, here it is, here's my app, you know, kind of like a cooking show. But I always run out of time. <laughs> and so I never get to show the app, or at the end, I'm like, show it really quick, but I never take the bite where it's, I say how good it is and it's burning my mouth, and, and it's, so my session looks more like this, usually. <laughs> But today I'm going to finally fix that. I'm going to start by showing the app. Okay? So, um, and then we will go back and I'll show you how to do it. So, let's see if I can actually do that. Just a little bit. Star Wars. Come on, it had to be Star Wars, right? This is the app. It's pretty simple. Um, it is uh, just showing you all the ships, starships in Star Wars world, and you can click on one and you can get some information, details about it that you didn't even know, like how much the Millennium Falcon costs. Um, it's a thousand, hundred thousand things, don't know what that means. And then, uh, you know, like what films they appeared in and things like that. Who produced it? Okay, so it's a pretty simple app, but that's what we're building, so keep this in mind. Okay. There's a list, there's some starships, you go to it, there's some details about it. Pretty simple, you can see the films. I've been successful today, that's all I have to do, you guys saw the app, so good enough. Have you guys heard about the Star Wars API, by the way? Is that the, that's what this is built about. Well, it, like, um, probably last year around this time, I ran into this thing, and I was like, I have to do something with this, because everyone's been doing, you know, the cat pictures, or it's a Twitter thing, I'm like, here's the new demo API. Uh, so let me just show it to you. There. Okay, so here's where it is, um, and you can get like planets, spaceships, vehicles, people, films, species, I like spaceships, sweet, because that's the best part of Star Wars in my mind. So anyway, here, this is the API we're going to be using, alright? So show the app, and uh, we're, we're already at success. <laughs> the other thing you'll know, if you've seen my, like, my talk last year, was that for me, apps are all about data, so I always start with the API when we go from there. So we've seen the app, let's talk about how to cook it. Start with this API. Um, when I play with an API, I like to use um, Postman. I don't know if any of you guys have used this tool. It's pretty, pretty common. If you have a better one for me, let me know. Um, but it pretty easily allows you to just throw in a URL, um, add headers, whatnot, and then see, see a response. So in this case, this is the uh, response for getting all starships. Just some things about this. Um, we can see that it gives us kind of like the total number of starships we're going to have. It has some pagination built in. And then in this, in this results here, we can see each of these things is a ship. Right? So there's a Death Star, there's the Millennium Falcon. 
And if I want to see like what films it in or the pilots are in, it's a series of URLs that send me to those films. If I want to see a film, like you saw, I'm showing films in the detail screen, that's why we're showing this. Um, I have to go get a film individually and I can get information about it, like the director, the producer, I can see what characters are in it, the people, something like that. Alright, so that that's the API that we're working with. Alright, so um, when I started thinking about this app, um, I didn't know what I wanted to build yet, because I'm just doing this kind of play around with it. I didn't know what my UI was going to look like. The first thing I wanted to do was get this API sort of harness I want to get under control. And I don't have to build a UI to exercise that. Because I don't know what the UI is going to be, and that's a whole bunch of work. I just want to be able to like run something that really quickly hits this API, and make sure that I can hit it, and my network stack works right, and I can get the object back I want. Um, so for my stack that I used, uh, again, it's the same stack that I talked about last year. I'm just going to assume you're all at my session, and so I'm just going to breeze over what those things are. But I'm using retrofit to, and to make my network calls. That's using actually OK HTTP under the hood for that. And then I use JSON to take the JSON responses and marshal those into objects. Okay, so it's that stack. Um, so what I'll, we'll start by, because I've got a lot to cover, I'll skip ahead to a few things. I just want to show you um, what, what I ended up with there. So for me, the way I, I structure this app is I have, uh, this is the retrofit part. I have the Star Wars API. This is the sort of the definition of that API, is what I call the remote service. And I've got two calls I want to make. I want to be able to get all the starships so I can show that first screen. And then, um, for the detail page, it turns out, I need uh, to get films for each URL. At this point, though, I didn't even know I was making a detail page. So I was worried about, like, how do I build these starships? And uh, if you know about um, how Retrofit works, I'm using uh, RX Java plugin to it, so I'm going to get an observable of a response, and we'll cover that a little bit. But um, the important thing is that I first thought I was just going to get a, like, a list of starships back. And then it turned out you saw that that API had like some pagination controls, like the, the URL for the next page or whatnot. So then I figured, well, I better actually, I'm probably going to have to expose that in my app at some time, even though for this demo I didn't have any pagination. But, so what I ended up with is this top-level component that looks like this. This represents sort of the full response that comes back from the service. And it has some type T in it, which is what, the, what it wraps. And in my case, it's going to actually always wrap some list of T. And so um, if we go back there, then we can see that what I ended up asking for was a page to API response of starships. So I'll get a response that has a list of starships, and the starship looks like this. It's just kind of a typical G, uh, JSON mapping. Uh, you can use this serialized name if the actual name it gives you isn't what you want to call it. Um, for instance, they have things called with underscore cost and credits, and I turn that into just cost and whatnot. So I just want to kind of point out what these fields are, because we're going to be looking at some stuff later, and it might be good to have sort of a mental picture in your mind of what these are. <laughs> so I just have one little pro tip here to talk about things that you might run into, because when I was building this, I just started working through this app, and I would just kind of take notes as I went along of like little things I ran into, like, oh, you need this version of this thing. Oh, that doesn't work. Oh, here's a bug. And I just keep those. And then I figured, well, I'll just share that with you because that makes a good presentation. And that's the things I want to know. So I have a few of those. I'll sprinkle in here. In this case, I started out by saying, well, cost should be like a float, right? And, and uh, passengers, that's like number of passengers. That should probably be an int. And I started that way. And then I started getting ships that would blow up on me. Um, and it turned out that the API was passing things like the string unknown or NA in the field. So, you, you know, you, it's like, I can't render the G side, I just can't render that into to an int. Um, and you could bit, make adapters that maybe work with that. That was kind of an answer like fine. Everything's a string. Everything's a string. Except uh, things that are represented as URLs, I decided to represent them as Android URIs. Because that gives you a little more type safety. Um, turned out to be not a great decision, and we'll see why for a little bit. Okay, that's kind of what our models look like. Also, we got a film, a lot, same kind of thing. Right? Okay. 
So now my goal is I want to uh, exercise this API. I want to have you build a whole UI, so I want to build a test to do this. So um, this is going to be an integration test. It's actually going to be a small test against a live, a live service. Um, so let's talk about how you set up integration tests in Android. For me, uh, it kind of helps to look at, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like, the different views that you do, like projects in Android View and Android Studio. And the Android View tries to collapse things and make it more sane with the project views, like the actual files. And sometimes it, it helps to see things that way. So the way that Android uh, structures these things is that There's the main package of where your code is running, you know, that's your main code. You have this Android test, which is your integration test. And then you have this other test folder, and these are your unit tests. Why? Just because. That's how it is. So just to let you know that, right now we're talking about the Android test. So what do we have to do to set up Android tests? Most of the work we have to do is in Gradle. start here. This instrumentation test runner. All Android integration tests use the Android JUnit runner, and we'll see where that's actually used. They don't have to use it, but by default, this one is. Sometimes you'll find people write custom ones. You can also write your own custom one. But by default, this is the one you use. So you have to just go, go into the default config, set that up. Uh, the other thing is there's some things that you, dependencies you need to provide in the class path. So, um, Gradle's got this uh, idea there's the test compile dependencies and then there's the Android test compile dependencies. The Android test compile dependencies are the ones that we need for integration tests. Okay, they kind of match the Android test folder. The ones that are test compiled are going to be dependencies that are used when you are running unit tests. Kind of, they kind of go along with the test folder. So for our integration testing right now, we are going to bring in the JUnit uh, jar and the dependencies we need for that test runner that we just, that we just talked about. OK. Now, how do you run an integration test? Um, So there's this build variants thing that Android Studio has. There's, I don't know why. I mean, I've been putting a lot of years. This thing just did not make sense to me right away. But why you even have to do this? But you have to like switch between: Do I want to run my instrumentation tests or do I want to run my unit tests? And depending on which one of these you have selected, when Android runs, it'll take in those different dependencies and give you different build paths, and it'll actually even like. Uh, kind of X out your unit tests. You can't actually run them, or you can't even find them in, in some of the tools when you're not in the unit tests. Thing. In fact, this is interesting. I just thought about this. If you do a refactoring of some of your code and your tests reference, uh, you have uh, references to that class. Let's say I rename a class. I have a reference to it in my unit test, and I have a reference to it in my Android uh, integration test. Depending on which one of these is selected is what the Android Studio will only refactor the ones in, like, say, the unit test, because that's why I selected here. When you go to run your Android unit test, you'll find out that it never changed the class names for you. It's crazy. Uh, Android Studio 2.0, they're working on a version that actually will combine these so they can all be run in the same environment and all that will take care of it. Hopefully, this will all go away. But for now, just remember, we got to switch back and forth when we're doing this. So that's what we need to do. All right. Let's look at the first test. So this is my, I just call it API test, right? This is a smoke test against a live, the live API. What are we doing? Uh, first of all, here's my, this here's the retrofit API that I need. I need to build up one of these. This is how I'm actually executing this code. Um, so this is just boilerplate of retrofit. If you don't understand that, um, that's OK. Uh, but I need an OK HTTP client. Um, and I need this JSON thing, because that's going to take my JSON and turn it into objects for me, those models that I showed you. And finally, I built the retrofit instance. So I do that in something called setup class. So this 
So J unit, and the Android J unit 4 is the extension of J unit 4, which gives you all these handy annotations. So again, the first thing here we're going to say is that we're going to run this test with this runner that we can say we're going to use here because we defined it earlier in our gradle. The for class is uh, an annotation that, um, so the way J unit works is that when you have a class with many tests in it, it's actually going to instantiate that class once, and then it's going to run all those tests with different methods, and there's a life cycle of that we can talk about. But the one, after it instantiates the class the first time, um, it will run these before class statements. Um, and actually that has to be, I guess, has to be, it always has to be static, but I found me, because I think the class is in it. Uh, it hasn't gone through full instantiation. You're not dealing with the instance of the class yet. You're just dealing with the class. Um, but anyway, you can set up static references like this. I don't need to create a new retrofit client. Each test in there, I just want one. So I do that in a before class. You don't have to call it setup class. Call it anything you want, as long as you annotate it with before class. And then each of my tests are annotated with a test annotation. Um, in JUnit 3, you used to have to like start the method names with test, blah, blah, blah. That was how you did that. You don't have to do that anymore. You should use test annotation in JUnit 4. All right. So let's look at these tests a little bit, and what are we doing? So here, I want to call my API to get starships. And I'm going to get back this observable response. So like I said, I'm using Arc's job, and that means that when I make this call to the API here, I just have an observable. It hasn't actually executed anything yet. And, when it, and when it doesn't execute until I subscribe to it. So I've got a subscriber here. Um, and once I subscribe, then uh, it's going to go out and make the calls, and it's going to come back, and it's going to give me my starships, but it's asynchronous. It's not a blocking call. And so if I just used a normal subscriber, this thing would go out and start making a call, and then my test would continue, and it would fail because it wouldn't have any starships yet, and, and you know, it would be null, right? I'd get no point of reception. So uh, Arts Java provides some facilities to help me with this. And the first one, the one that we'll probably use the most here, is called the test subscriber. And the test subscriber, it's very easy to just build a subscriber. What it does is it subscribes to all the calls, and it, it blocks while it gets all the events and it waits for everything to happen, either until it completes or it errors, and then it finishes, and then it sends to the next line. So it's an easy way to give you uh, synchronous uh, calls to observables. And then you can actually make assertions on that thing to see what happened. So first of all, we can say, let's make sure, to, make sure we didn't have any error events. We can make sure that we actually completed and then we can also say, well, how many things did I get? Now I'm asking for a response of one. That's what I'm expecting, one thing that. Um, all right, so that's some of the things that, that's our first kind of uh, helper that we have. The second thing we have to help us here with this integration test is um, So you can also do normal JUnit assertions if you see that you can uh, see that uh, the response is successful, um, and that that actually that is success is just part of like okay to be there just giving you a response back, um, and you can and then in this case I'm getting the count. Now if you remember that API gave me a count of everything, and it said in our case I think it's at 37. So why am I just saying greater than zero here? Um, and, and also, I'm getting a starship, but I'm not really interrogating it all. I'm just making sure it's not null. Well, in this case, I'm testing a live API. I'm just writing a small test. This thing could change in any day. Tomorrow, it could be 38 results, 47. I have no idea. And if I'm running this in, like, say, some CI environment, this test is going to constantly fail. So when I'm going against a live API, really, the only reason I have this test is just to make sure they didn't make some breaking change that's going to overall break the contract. But I can't interrogate like specific fields, or I can't even make sure that all my model mappings are correct. Um, for that, I really want a controlled environment where I know what the responses are going to look like. So I want to have canned responses. All right, so how do I do that? Um, what I do is I just would go to Postman, for instance, and I just copy these things, the one that I'm expecting, and save it as a file somewhere, and then I just read that file as part of my test. So how do we, how do, we do that with integration? 
Okay. Or if you want to read resources in an integration test, the way I do it is using the assets folder. So an Android test, uh, it didn't come there by default, by the way, it doesn't create when you have to go in and create assets under the test. And then you can put, uh, for instance, I just call it Star Trek JSON. Here it is. So how do I read that in an integration test? Let's look at another one. Okay, in this GSI mapping test, this time, I'm not really concerned about making an actual network call because I'm not going against a real API. Now I really just, I want to just assume that I get this network response back. And, and in this case, I want to just work on my GSI mappings because if you've ever had to map a JSON response into some object using JSONs, it can be really finicky and give you all kinds of weird isn't it? And so, um, so I just want to do that in a way that's controlled. I don't care about client retrofit. I just need this JSON mode. And what I'm doing here really is doing the stuff that retrofit would be doing for me. So here's the key. You can just get the context, and then you can ask for asset, and then you can open your file. Now, here's something tricky about integration tests. I'm saying get context. Get what context? You know, when you're running an integrate, uh, Android integration test, there's actually two applications on your device. There's your, your application, our, our Star Wars application, and this is actually another test application that Android sends up there too. And actually, if you go into your apps on the device, you can see them both listed. Um, and so the test application is actually what they call instrumenting your application. So there's actually two contexts. There's a context that your, your test application has, and then there's context of your app as well. Um, in this case, I want to read these asset files <laughs> that are inside this Android test context. This means this is in the test context itself. So this is sort of hidden from you, but um, I actually did a static import of instrumentation registry get context. That's the test context. Inst instrumentation registry also has another method called get target context, which would be the context of the, te the app you're testing. All right, so that's just kind of one of those tricks, and sometimes it's a little confusing. That's why you have to know which context you're talking about, because I'm trying to read files that I've got in my test area. They're not files that are shipped with the app, for instance. OK, after that, everything's the same. I can actually now say, um, OK, I can actually assert that something's 37 because I've got a static file that I know it's always 37. So as long as I've mapped my stuff right, I should be able to get 37 from this count. And now I can assert more things um, about the Starship. OK, this is still kind of expensive. I still have to start this up on an emulator and run this every time. And again, like I said, keeps on really finicky. And I want to do this really quick and find my errors. So I want to actually do it as a unit test. All right, so how do I do that? Well, first thing I have to do is do that weird thing where I go over here and go to get my build variants and turn to unit test so I can actually work with it. All right. Now, if we look at this in the Android view, what you'll notice is when I switch these back and forth, um, see here. You will see like this uh, go from test to Android test as you're switching back and forth. It won't show my test classes in the Android view when I'm, my unit test classes when I'm in Android, in the Android test view. So it's trying to be helpful. So I've got a unit test here that I'm trying to do this GSON mapping with. Again, I'm not doing anything different than I was doing the integration test and building this builder up. And I'm reading in this, uh, I'm, this time, I'm reading in the resources from somewhere else. Where did I put them? There's no assets when you're doing unit tests, so where do they go? Well, you can't see it through this Android view. You should have to go into like project view where you can see everything. And under test, you can create yourself a resources file. This is more like this is just straight job. Maybe you know this and jobs in the same place as under like source test resources. And then I can put it there. And the way that you read in that file then is like normal Java. From your test class, you say get resource as stream, and then you can read in your file. 
And by the way, that's at the root level, so that that beginning flash is important. That was like 10 minutes of my life last week. Um, so I always forget how to do read resources and test this. Just don't do that. But there you go. Pro tip number two or three. Okay, here's actually um, something worth. Let's actually run a test. Let's just see what happens. So that's my keep that short test for clips. What is happening here? Uh, okay, method parse Android not mocked for details. Hey, okay, this actually, this is probably the sweetest error message I've ever seen because it actually gives you a link to uh, doc documentation on Android Studio that says how to fix it. Because it happens so often, I guess, which is great. So what the problem is, when you're doing unit tests with Android, you, it still has a whole bunch of Android classes and they need an implementation. And in the real world, that implementation is actually provided by the device. And so they need to supply this Android jar that like face that off for you. And a whole bunch of the objects in there just have like methods that are stubbed out that say throw runtime exception, right? They don't work at all. And so that makes unit testing in Android really difficult. More recently, with some of the uh, more recent changes Android's do, they've provided a new Android jar that has like better uh, abilities to handle more of these things for you. This is why you used to have to use like um, so anyway, but URI is not one of them. URI, what you find out they're saying here is that um, this isn't mocked, and what you're supposed to do is, um, let's see, you go, this is just what it's going to do, you don't ask questions, you just do the thing. Like they say, okay, go to this test option, make, create this test options, and say unit test return default value is true, and that will make that will trigger something kind of like auto value, I suppose, that they're going to try and guess at something, give you the most reasonable default value for this out there. All right, so we do that. And then we try and run this guy and see what happens. No pointer. Okay, it's a different error. We're a little further. So the default value that they do is null. <laughs> oh, man. So, okay, so if you're using URI, pro tip number four, if you're using URIs, you cannot unit, you can't do unit tests that assert anything about their values, okay? So in my, in this test that I'm working on here, uh, I think that I have, right, unit, URI mock values always fruit null on this test, this will always fail, all right? That'll always fail. Should be able to run this again. Pass. Yes. Live demos for the win. Okay. So that's that's that. So really, I need to actually go back to my integration test if I want to do full testing for this. Okay. Now there's something else I want to. Like I said earlier, I'm not sure what my decision to use URIs. Um, so when JSON is trying to parse a URI, they're trying to give you take a JSON thing and turn it into something that you say is a URI. Um, it needs to find something with a default constructor to make so to create a URI instance and then set these values on it. Well, a URI is one of those classes that doesn't have one of those. It has like a just, it's like, um, well, let's find out. Because you have to build your own thing. So, um, let's see here. All right. You, a type, this is a JSON thing. You have to create your own custom type adapter. And that's because the way that your eyes are built is you give it a string and you call parse, right? So it has its, its own constructor. So this is just something that you have to know that if you want, and there's other classes like this, right? That they don't, you can't say new class. They have some kind of builder method that you have to use. And in that case, you have to write custom adapters. And so where do I use them? Where, how does that get hooked in? And that's right here in the builder. 
you can you register these adapters and say, hey, when you see something that says it, you need to make a URI class out of it, this is how you're going to build it. All right. So just buy a viewer on that one. That was, that was fun to work through. OK, so now we have uh, <coughs> we've kind of marshaled this API. Let's talk about the application a little bit. If you want to follow along, by the way, here's the GitHub URL. If you want us to, yeah. I'll have it at the end too. I should throw it there earlier for you. So what I want to do is I want to have an app that has good separation between like the service layer, the UI layer, network layer, so I can test these things independently. And I'll show that in a second. I'll do this up here for a while. But this is where Dagger comes in to help me. Something else we want to talk about. And um, how does it do that? Well, I don't want to have to have, uh, say, my list fragment create an instance of this uh, Star Wars API service every time it wants to make a network call. Um, one, because I actually don't want to, I can't create one of those every time, so I can't do it in the fragment anyway. And also because it's not really the fragment's job to actually manage the lifecycle of that thing. I, I, don't, I don't even want to, when I'm working on the UI, I don't even care how that thing's built. I just need one. Just give me one. That's all I want. And that's what Dagger allows you to do. That's what other DI frameworks allow you to do, too. I'm just going to use Dagger as an example. Um, because you can just say, I, I need this, and I need this, and I need this. You figure out how to build them. And in another place in my code, I have figured out how to build them. And it's all kind of encapsulated. One nice area, this is how I build all the things. And here's, all the, here's all the dependencies. And it's, it's actually, once you get into a bigger application where your dependency graph is really confusing, and if this stuff is all over the place in 10,000 files, it's really crazy to work through, especially if you all of a find out that you have a circular dependency that you're trying to work through. Um, so having everything in one place is, can be really helpful. All right. This is what we have. Super simple for this example, right? Because all I have is a list detail. Uh, they're using recycler view adapters in the middle. Hopefully, we'll have enough time to show why that's important. Um, a local service, local service, and a remote service. Uh, we'll see why they'll split those up. And okay, GTP. Okay. What are we going to do with that? Um, I want to talk a little bit about Dagger. But not too much because this can take up a whole session. And actually, Dan Lu is having a session on Dagger at 3. So I'm going to kind of try to whip through that or in just in the interest of time because I'm more interested in showing you what using Dagger allows us to do in a test. Okay. So um, let's look at the list fragment because that will give you some sense of what we're talking about. Here is a key thing in Dagger. Is you, this is just the inject annotation. Yeah. Do you use it just for reference? Do you use Dagger like two or one? Two. Okay. Good question. Dagger two. I figure if I'm going to start, I'll start. Um, so inject annotation. This is actually just a normal Java inject annotation. Uh, in this case, I'm going to say, hey, this guy needs the Star Wars API and um, also props. Which I'm not doing anything with it, but it demonstrates that you can inject uh, Android things as well. And then. How, what it, so, how does it get that? <coughs> and it's on create. This is the line I care about, 73. It's going to get the application, and something called the application component, which I named, could be anything. And then it's going to say inject this. So it's getting really, uh, it's getting an a, a instance of, let's just call it Dagger. And then saying, uh, Dagger, will you inject me with all the things that I need? And then Dagger will look at those things that you've asked about injecting and say, sure, I'll go get an instance of those because I've been talking about those. So that is a super short summary of what Dagger does and how you connected it. So you have to tell Dagger, you have to ask to be injected. And you have to tell Dagger beforehand, what are the things that I'm going to inject? Because Dagger, this version, uh, are run at compile time. They're not using reflection. They're not runtime. So they need to they need to know at compile time, sort of like what's the top level of your graph, so I can figure out at compile time I will look for all the things you're you're going to need to inject. 
and I'll figure out all the dependencies that those things need. All right, so get build that up. And so there's this actually really cool thing about Dagger, and if anyone wants to like hit me up at lunch or whatever, I can show you, is that it generates really readable code, right? So it's code generation, and it puts it in uh, generated sources, blah, blah. You, you can just look at it. It's not magical at all. And if you want to, you can really walk through exactly how it satisfies these dependencies and what happens when you call object. Um, it's actually really cool. It's a good way to learn it. For me, um, learning Dagger, it's like, I read those documents so many times, and it's just so confusing until you just do it. And then and then it doesn't work, and then you fix it, and you're like, oh, I get it. And that's the only way that I can even explain how to learn it. It's just one of those things. It's hard to get. I think it's the same way of our job. It's like, you just have to work with it, and then you'll finally figure it out. By the way, last year I gave some advice that Dan Lu did not want me to say it's really a bad idea. I knew it was a bad idea. But you can't just say, if math doesn't work, do flat math. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> so from last year, ignore that. It still works like 50% of the time, at least. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to skip through some of the stuff because I, I, it's not, I'm not going to have to go past like how, where all this stuff comes from or else we're just never going to do all the things. Um, let's look at, let's go right to some good stuff. All right. I want to show you another unit test. I'm going to have to figure out which one are you actually showing right now. We're in Android, so. <coughs> Now one thing I want to do, if you remember, I want to be able to show in this detail on the screen um, all the films of um, a ship. But the films, um, you can't just like get a list of them, right? I got a list of URLs, and to show actually the details of the film, I actually have to go out and hit every URL. And I really wanted, I didn't want my, um, the UI layer to think about that kind of craziness. I, I just want to be able to ask something for the films for a ship. And so, um, I, what I do often um, is I will take uh, something like that, uh, this is retrofit search, which is very the raw API that somebody else provides, in this case the Star Wars guy, and I'll wrap that in my own, uh, my own service. So I'm here, all right? So, so I have my own lo local service, and that other, um, <coughs> architecture diagram I was showing had local service or remote service, and this is what I mean. So you can see that this service actually also needs the Star Wars API. And in this case, I'm actually probably inject on the constructor. Um, there's two things that this allows. One is that um, Dagger can do field injection or it can do constructor injection. I think it can do center injection, but they recommend uh, you either inject field or inject constructor. And uh, when I ask it to inject the Star Wars service, um, it, it will, if I had, you know, 10 arguments in here, it would, and they could all be satisfied by Dagger, it would actually inject this. The other thing that this does is, um, anytime you put an inject on a constructor in one of your classes, it tells Dagger that it is allowed to make an instance of this if something else says it needs Star Wars services. Like, oh, how do I make that? Oh, oh, there it is. Cool, I'll make it. As long as it also knows how to make Star Wars API, it can build up that graph and give Star Wars services on so here um, is uh, my code to get all the film appearances, which is um, uh, just a little arch Java way of saying, um, go out and for each film that the Starship has, get its URL, and then or get the film by URL, and for each film then return an observable. And then I flat map that and it turns it into one observable stream of films. Okay? And so I wanted to actually write a, a unit test for that because to me, um, that's ideal for a unit testing. Here's this little thing, and it's kind of tricky because it's our job. And should I map or flat map? I'm not sure. Why not just like write a unit test and like put in stuff till it works? Um, so what are some things I have to do here? Okay. So one thing I want to introduce to, or you might already know about, is Machino. So Machino is a mocking library, um, and in order to use it, there's again some few uh, 
dependencies of Pro and Gradle. Uh, it's well documented on the Marquito site of how you do it. Marquito did let you do a few things, um, and I'll just show you some quick examples so you understand it. One is uh, this rule that effectively just allows you to use this annotation, and it will create a mock version of the Star Wars API for me every time it runs the test, every test execution. Um, another thing up here is, um, well, let's see with Marquito. So, I can also, if I just want to create something inside a single test, I can mock it right there with uh, this. This is just a static import for mock. It also would say mockito.mock films, right? So I can say I'm going to mock some films up. Because in this test, I'm going to test this thing. So the first thing I need to do is actually create this starship. You'll see this is a lot of work, right? What I really want is a starship. And when you ask the starship for films, it returns the URIs, because that's what the first thing the service needs. And then every time it uh, asks the uh, does gets the URI, it should return the film for that URI. So that's what all this is building up. Now, Makita will say you should not be mocking like simple value objects like just film and photos or whatever. But um, for me, these are kind of read-only models that are created by the mapping between JSON and JSON. So I mean, I don't have like setters on these things. So you could, I have done this, create a constructor on this and have a way to make these objects just for your test. So maybe that's a good practice. But just to show as another example here, um, <coughs> you can mock these whole things out if you want. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, we are finally being able to, uh, so, oh, this is interesting. OK. So I need to be able to mock, actually, not just classes, but I also need to mock um, the response that comes back from location TV from retrofit, because that's what, that's what my service returns. Um, and actually, they provide a really easy way to do that. You can see it, this response object, this is from location TV. You get it when you uh, bring in retrofit. It has very easy, just like success method. And it will give you a full HTTP response that's successful, the 200, and the, the body will be um, the film that, you, that you're returning, whatever your response returns. They also have response error. You, know, you can have an error and give it the code you want to return if you want to test your uh, code in that. So that's actually a really nice, uh, easy way to do that. So what am I doing here? I did all this work up here to create films. At the end of the day, I'm saying, um, I have two responses that are observables of film one and film two. When the API get filmed by URL uh, gets called, it will return those two responses. And all that stuff finally happens. I can finally execute this test that says, hey, service, give me film appearance to the Starship. I'm going to use this test subscriber again. I'm going to subscribe. At the end, I can make sure that it completed, that I've got two films. And you can actually assert that the values that you return, these are the things that it gave you on the uh, next calls, were actually film one and film two, the mocks that I set up originally. Um, if you want to dig into it further, you can actually get the actual on next events. And you can assert that, hey, the film that I got in position zero, the first film, is actually the film one. The, their titles are the same, whatnot. OK, things like that. The last thing you can do in Mockito is what's called a verify step. In this case, um, what I want to prove is that when I actually get observable to this service here, right here, that actually nothing happens until I subscribe. So in this test, I'm calling the service, get film appearances, and then I'm verifying that the API has never been called. Or, or this method, get filmed by URL with a string, any string, was never called. And then I subscribe, and then I can see that it got called two times because it got called for each film. Okay? So that's kind of how verify works. All right. So one last thing, super out of time. Like I said, if I would have shown you guys that app at the beginning, we would never have seen it. <laughs> the last thing I talk about is espresso tests. And we're not going to get into all the details of that, unfortunately. Um, and there's a lot of great information about it. And I mean, Chris just did the talk last year, and you guys were all there anyway. So it's fine. All the things he said still apply. But there's one new thing, so I just want to cover that. Um, all right, so back we go. So Espresso comes built in with um, 
Espresso is a way that you can like ask, find a view in your UI, and then either perform an action like find a button, click on it, or find a you uh, like a text and assert that the text has a certain value, or you can text in it, or you can click and wait for the next screen to appear. Things like that. It's very simple. It's got three three main actions: find a view, perform an action, assert that something happened, um, and when you are working with lists, like a list view, um, you might have a hundred things, and they're not actually drawn on the screen yet, but they're there. And you want to assert that you know list 90, 99 is there, um, but it's not drawn. So normal test frameworks uh, didn't provide the ability to do that. So they have the thing called like on data, and what on data would do would be to interrogate the adapter, find that list 99, and actually draw it on the screen as if you had scrolled up or whatever, and then you could assert things about that view. Well, if you started using the recycler view, um, which is the, the new hotness, then you'll find that Espresso's on data doesn't work with recycler view. Because on data only works with things that are adapter views, and recycler view is not an adapter view. So recycler view is just like view. Um, and then there's a guy here who knows so much more about it than me, I can't even talk about what it is. <laughs> but uh, so Fortunately, very recently, maybe just uh, um, recent to me, they have provided a facility, someone provided it, because it's in Espresso for Trips, a uh, facility to actually do something similar to Undata. So I just want to show you that. And it's these Recycler View Actions. Recycler View Actions allow you to scroll to, in this case, a holder. All Recycler Views have an adapter with the view holder pattern. And um, so you can find that view holder, and then you can uh, assert stuff about the view or perform actions. The thing is, you have to give it your own uh, matcher. And this is something you actually build frequently in Espresso anyway. It kind of comes with some built-in ones that are nice. But in this case, I just want to show you what that, that takes. Um, this is not that hard. So a view holder matcher. This takes in a recycled view holder. So what it's going to do, when you give it a matcher, it's going to go into your adapter and, and with all the view holders, and it's going to basically just uh, give you each of those back, and it's going to call your match is safely method and say, is this the one you're looking for? Is this the one you're looking for? And you decide what it determines it's the one you're looking for. In my case, I wanted to make sure that uh, this view holder was a type of view holder that I passed in because my view has a couple different types of view holders, and also that it matches whatever uh, criteria I gave it. So what do I have here? A couple helpers to say. One is like matching film returns a new view holder of type film view class. Okay, and how do I use that? Here's an example. When I show the detail page, I have a test that makes sure every film shows up. So I say I want scroll the holder matching film that has text episode seven, that has text episode six, episode five, and so on. What does this have to send it thing? Well, when you get the view holder, you get the actual view holder class. And if you know view holders, it probably has like many views in it, all the views that you show in that row. So I can't just assert that the view itself has this text because it doesn't. But one of the things inside of it, one of the sentences, has text this. And so this is a way to actually assert that something is displaying on the screen. Um, now, because I don't have time to show everything here, um, we can go back to. Go back to the Star Wars demo. There's another important thing on there, which is how do we deal with um, uh, RX Java integration tests? Because in reality, it's not happening blocking, and some of these tests will fail intermittently if things don't happen fast enough. Espresso provides a way for you to do that. It's called Idling Resources, and I've put together a custom one that you can use for RX Java, so you can use that in your code. Can't show it now, it's my time, I'm sorry, but thanks for your time, I really appreciate it.